Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and joining me from the Great Western Theater of the War is my friend Tim Smith. Good morning, Tim. Good morning. How you doing? I'm doing real well. How about you? Good. Doing fine. Doing fine. Fantastic. Now, I feel like you've been so successful in your writing lately. Like, I feel like I've had you on every other week, you know, it's been, <laughs> which is a, a great pleasure. But I mean, you've been well, knocking I, them out. I appreciate it. I appreciate the, the support and I always love doing these things with you. Love talking Vicksburg. And I'm about uh, to convert you into Vicksburger, right? <laughs> you have. You have. Yeah. I, am, I am a believer. I am a true believer. So. <laughs> great. so I wanted to chat with you today about your newest, the Inland Campaign for Vicksburg. And I, as I said, when I reached out to you, I was a little surprised because I wasn't quite expecting it. And so I think maybe the beginning of July, I saw that it had come out in May and I was like, oh, cut me off guard. So <laughs> I'm a little, I feel like I'm a little late on the take here. Ah, well, though they did come out a pretty quickly. I managed to do one volume a year and, uh, you know, by this point, I've got it down to pretty much a science. I can, I can run through this stuff pretty quickly quickly um because the research is already done i figured out a long time ago don't keep going back to the national archives for every book just do it all at, at once and so you've got it all at your fingertips and it's just a matter of kind of putting it together and, and getting it done so but it's an enjoyable process so. yeah yeah well it's been an enjoyable to read along and now this yeah. is the the third book in a five book series but you started at the end and kind of backtracked yeah uh, so you're plugging that, in the uh, gap yeah yeah <laughs> I I never can seem to do these series in order uh, just simply because I don't think ahead enough. I When I started this, I didn't intend to do five volumes on Vicksburg. And so it just turned out that way. And, you know, 30 years from now, people won't look at copyright dates. Probably they'll just look at, at the five volumes. So I don't guess it really matters. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a, a fantastic read. I've been excited to, to, to get this one Thanks, Tell me, like, why did you start where you started uh with the assaults book yeah yep. uh yeah well um actually i was kind of tooling around when i finished the tennessee river uh, campaign trilogy which actually is a prequel to these five volumes so you could really say the whole mississippi valley campaign kind of is eight volumes there you know uh it's uh alan nevin's kind of stuff you know those those eight volumes he did that everybody had from the history book club remember those yeah. nobody's read but uh anyway the um i finished those three and started looking you know what am i going to do do next and i a very glaring gap in the historiography was the uh, assaults at Vicksburg. So everybody just kind of glosses over those and includes them in the siege and, and all that. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll do that. And in fact, I think I told the story in the in the preface to that book. I can't remember. Um, but I, Mike Ballard at the time was uh, talking about doing a book on the siege. And um, I thought, well, I don't want to step on his toes. Of course, uh, he's he's uh, uh, much better historian than I and all that. So I, I won't I won't do it if he's going to deal heavily with the assaults. I you know, talked to him and he said, oh, no, I'm not I'm not really only even going to deal with the assaults, just the siege. And so I thought, well, there's there's my my uh, OK there. And he said, you do the assaults, I'll do the siege and we'll have Vicksburg covered. And so unfortunately, of course, Mike passed away before he did the siege book. And so when I finished the assaults book. I said, well, you know, it would be logical now just to go on and do a book on the siege. So I did, uh, I did that one, and then I got to thinking, well, heck, why not go back and do the the whole campaign? If I've got these, you know, big thick books on a portion of it, why not do kind of a series? So that's why I went back to the beginning of Star Wars and uh, did the did the the, the three before. So. Yeah, I really love when Darth Maul shows up to fight Farragut's fleet there uh, in that first book. <laughs> <Yeah>. It's great. <laughs> so, and, and you know, one of the things that I really kind of uh, liked about that process is, you know, the the, the assaults are something that, that people are pretty familiar with, even if they don't know much about it. So it was kind of like a good entry into the story. And then, you know, you kind of got us through the siege and then backed up to tell i think a, a really forgotten part of the vicksburg campaign and that's all the stuff that happens in the summer of 62 and through the fall and all that stuff yeah well you know the thought has actually crossed my mind of going back and doing a prequel to the prequel um a sixth volume you know but uh 
I, number one, I don't want to go to the well too many times, you know, and, and number two, I'm kind of Vicksburged out right, at this <laughs> point. So, um, and number three, Ed Bars has a, a good book on, you know, rebel victory at Vicksburg. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure there's uh, a need to go back and do anything on that. So. Uh, back it up to the siege for just a second. And as you know, I've like written like baby steps of Vicksburg stuff uh, compared to your extremely thorough and magisterial. Well, it's all good stuff that you're you're doing. I'm hoping you're going to do something on Raymond and Big Black River Bridge and all of those. So you have you have made me a believer. I am a I'm a huge believer in the Vicksburg campaign now. Good. So. Um, but but I found that the siege was really hard to kind of get my arms around just because. It's it's such a moving target. The, the armies are, I mean, you know, Grant's army particularly is evolving so much, and there's just so much stuff happening along all the line, and uh, you know, for for forty some days. And how did how did you get your arms around that? Well, th that you know, every book is different, and people ask me, how do you do this? And and you know, I tell them, well, it depends on on the book. Um, you know, for instance, people ask about Shallow. How'd you write the Shallow book? And and actually, because I was so familiar with the story, I actually just sat down and wrote. I, I knew how the breakdown was going to be and all that. And I, I sat down and I just basically wrote the chapters from memory and then filled in with the official records and manuscripts and quotes and, and all that. So I knew the story I want to tell there. Other books, Fort Henry, Fort Donaldson, I was not nearly as is um, uh, immersed in the subject. So I had to do a lot of official records, you know, report reading and, and all that. So every book is different, but the Vicksburg book is different than any book I, uh, or the siege book is different than any book I've ever done because you had six weeks of the same old thing over and over and over. And I certainly didn't want to do it in a topical fashion and take a chapter on uh, you know, the Navy and a chapter on the Confederates and a chapter on the, I wanted to do it on all of these. Uh, I wanted to do chronological. And so for instance, the bio campaign book um, where most authors deal with Yazoo yeah, pass and then get done with that. And then stills bio and get done with that and canal and get done with that. Actually, all this is happening at the same time. So I wanted to present it chronologically to show that there Grant has a lot of balls, you know, in the air that he's, he's juggling here. And but kind of the same thing with the, the siege book, because, you know, you're dealing with so many different things, but it's all the same over and over and over. So if you did it week by week, you'd just be telling a lot of the same story over and over and over. So what I decided to do is kind of a hybrid. Um, I would I did it chronologically, but I would base each chapter around something significant in that chronological period. But I would fill in gaps in that chapter, maybe with a more generic uh, section on skirmishing that, you know, and use examples from that week specifically, uh, maybe a, a, a generic example of life in Vicksburg, uh, using a specific something from from that week. And so I really remember, for instance, um, I believe it's the last week of May. I centered it kind of around the naval aspects and the sinking of the uh, what what ironclad was it, Carondelet? I believe. I, I, oh, the, the Cincinnati. Cincinnati. That's what it was. Again, that's been several books ago. But um, anyway, the, the I kind of organized it as best I could around significant events. Uh, obviously, blowing up the mine or the um, you know. Um, of course, when you get back down to the surrender, you 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 easy to do it chronologically there. But anyway, that that's that was a a difficult something to to piece together and to make it chronological, but also cover all the all the aspects. Um, and uh, I, I well remember I would, you know, thank goodness for for computers and copy and paste, because I would take this section out of this chapter and move it to this one and and still trying to make all the chapters relatively even, you know, and, and all that. So it was quite a challenge. Uh, but I will have to say it was one of the more fun books that I've, I've done, I think, because of the challenge and to try to make it make it work out. And. I may be biased a little bit. I don't know, but I think it turned out pretty well. And I, I like, I like how it turned out. So I'm satisfied. And if, if uh, I'm satisfied, I guess, uh, I guess I've, I've uh, achieved the goal. So. Well, I thought it was a fantastic read. So I'm yeah, satisfied. I appreciate as well. it. Good. <laughs> now the, the latest one is, 
probably the most chronological phase of the whole campaign where Grant crosses the river and does his campaign. But I really like the twist you put on it in that you call it the inland campaign. And I remember you and I talking about like your, your the process you went through about trying to figure out what to actually call it because most people think of the overland campaign. Overland, yeah. In, in Virginia. Tell me a little yeah. bit about you know how you came to, to you know calling this the inland campaign. Well, I wanted to differentiate it from, uh, obviously, the 1864, uh, your stuff out there, Spotsylvania, and your new book coming out and, and all of that, and Gordon Ray's, you know, five volumes. Uh, and, and that name, not that it was kind of already taken, uh, but um, since we're dealing with a significant river crossing and moving inland from uh, not just, I mean, your Rappahattock and, and Rapidan are significant rivers up there, but not quite like the Mississippi River so it's 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 certainly moving inland from a major body of water so I thought that was a good good different take on it and what you know whether it's uh, uh, I don't mean to coin a phrase or anything like that and I actually I look back at earlier books and there are a few here and there that would mention you know moving inland or the inland campaign from the river or something so it's not like i created anything new but um i did want to differentiate it from the 1864 virginia stuff now for folks who are, are looking at this book can you give us a quick synopsis of the events that you cover in this since uh, you know since we're talking about sequence what is that sequence you've got in this book yeah well grant crosses the river course on april the 30th and begins to move inland uh, and makes a big hook uh, around by Jackson, of course, uh, you know, well, and then moves to Vicksburg. And um, so in those 17 days, he fights five battles, Port Gibson, Raymond, Jackson, uh, Champion Hill, Big Black River Bridge. And really, this is the the critical point of Grant's critical gamble. I talk about it shallow, you know, Albert Sidney Johnson going to the front line because it's the critical point of the critical gamble. Um and, and that's basically what it is for Grant. This is Grant's uh, do or die kind of thing. If th this, you know, each of the first six attempts to get across the river, um, if they didn't work, which they didn't, there was always a backup plan or there was a, an option. Grant, Grant didn't, um, he didn't risk or gamble the entire army on, on any one of those those moves. If if a portion that was conducting the the Yazoo Pass operation had been you know gobbled up by the Confederates or something, it wouldn't have ruined the army. It wouldn't have ended the campaign. Anything like that. Not so with this one. If if Grant fumbles this one uh, and it doesn't succeed, then the game is up. You know it it um, you know Grant actually says himself, I could be captured or killed or or whatever. Um, I'm not sure if Grant sustains a huge cataclysmic of defeat in in you know the interior of Mississippi if the army even gets out or, or you know if if uh, if Grant survives uh, certainly in terms of reputation I'm not sure Grant Sherman survived this so um, you know all that's that's kind of speculation but it is significant there is no backup plan this is this is the last option. Um, and so as Grant moves inland and fights these battles and moves toward Vicksburg, it's a, it's a pretty critical gamble. Uh, and not just, we may get into this, I don't know, but not just militarily. He's got to win these battles, and it helps that he's, um, you know, against a, a less than stellar Confederate commander, John C. Pemberton. Although I have been doing some Napoleonic stuff and comparing Vicksburg with Napoleon's uh, campaign against Ulm. Uh, in fact, after after Vicksburg, uh, Henry Halleck writes Grant and says these operations compare favorably with Napoleon's operations about Ulm, which is pretty high praise from Henry Halleck uh, of all people. Uh, but I did a I did a comparative study of Ulm and Vicksburg, and actually what I what I came to conclude was that Grant really had a harder uh, uh, road to hoe than Napoleon did. And one of those reasons, several different reasons, Grant had the whole naval thing to deal with and the big river and the Danube is nothing like uh, uh, the Mississippi River. But one of those reasons is that Grant had a more active and determined opponent than Napoleon had in the hapless general or the unhappy General Mack, I think is what uh, um, what they what he was termed as at, at uh, during the Ulm campaign in 1805. At any rate, 
um, I made a point and uh, wrote an article on this and made a point that, you know, it's hard to, to say uh, Pemberton is, did a good job or, 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 you know, was, was competent or whatever in the Vicksburg campaign. But when compared with General Mack at home in 1805, he looked pretty good, you know. So um, anyway, Grant um, is, is opposing Pemberton. Uh, it helps that Pemberton is not that stellar, uh, but it's still a pretty close run critical thing. Uh, and I think the point I started to make during all that, but uh, was, was that it's not just militarily, it's also logistically. Grant's walking a very fine line um, in terms of how many supplies he has, how much ordnance, how much commissary, how much quartermaster goods that he has and how much he can bring up uh, in terms of time before he reaches a new base of supplies on the Yazoo River, which he's got to fight his way to. And um, I've determined looking at the letters and diaries of these men that it got pretty critical uh, there toward the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, that, that week of May. Um, it, you know, and, and it's pure speculation, but if, if Pemberton somehow could have, uh, held and delayed a little bit longer, um, you know, it might, the situation could have gotten dire for Grant, but, uh, of course we'll, we'll never know. There's that great uh, passage he writes in his memoir. And of course he's got some years of hindsight to think of this, but he talks about how, you know, I was on the opposite side of the Mississippi at last, but I've got the river to my back and I don't have a, a great base of supplies and I'm in enemy territory, but at least I'm on dry land on the same side as the enemy. Same side of the river as the enemy. Yeah. That's pure yeah. grant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that quote. I use it a couple, in a couple of the books, one to end the, the, the bio one and then to begin this one. So, yeah. So, and, and it, it boils down the stakes you know, pretty dramatically for him. Um, and you, you talk about he's, he literally has everything to win, everything to lose. Um, what sort of grade do you give him as the, the campaign begins, you know, as he's trying to get his feet underneath him and, and figure this out? The, the 17 days, the Sinland yeah. campaign. Oh, I give him, give him high marks. Um, I, I, you know, he writes a, he writes a letter over in June, I think during the siege, he's writing to his father and he says, um, you know, I wanted so much more out of this Vicksburg campaign. He's got Vicksburg surrounded. It's just a matter of time. But he says, I wanted this to, to matter a whole lot more. And I'm thinking, you know, I think it's pretty good way, way it is. But he wasn't satisfied. Uh, but at the end of that letter, he, he says, you know, it, it, I wanted more of it. But I looking back, I can't see any any bad decision or I can't remember exactly the way he put it, but um, no, no fumble, you know, um, nothing we could have done really different. And so uh, I give him pretty high marks. I don't, I don't see a whole lot that he could have um, done just very differently um, given the, the, you know, questionability of Pemberton. Uh, Grant at times assumes Pemberton's going to do certain things because anybody with any logic probably in a military education probably would do that, you know, uh, and then Pemberton does, doesn't do it. So that that keeps him off balance just a little bit, but that's one of those fog of war things, you know, I'm reading some Napoleon stuff now and, and uh, Napoleon was completely uh, befuddled at, at Yana, for instance, and thought he was fighting the whole German Prussian army. And turns out he's fighting a little bit of it. And the, the main bulk of the army was, was elsewhere. But uh, so that, that happens, but I don't, I can't uh, give Grant anything, but, uh, but I ate on this. So. I think an important part of that is uh, a section of the book that you give a lot of attention to that t tends to get overlooked. You call it the lull with a capital yeah. L, the lull. Um, so he he gets across the river, he gets through Port Gibson, which we'll, we'll backtrack on. But then there's this period of of like getting his act together, getting his ducks in a row, whatever cliche we want to use. And most histories sort of skip over that because they want to get to the, the marching and the fighting. The battles, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but you really, I think, do a great job of kind of diving into that and explaining how beneficial that is for him and how well he uses that time. Right. Well, you know, a lot of people talk about Grant, the Vicksburg campaign, Blitzkrieg, all of that. I was extremely swift movements and, and all that. Not, not really. So, um, 
by the time you get to the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, yeah, you're starting to, to have some rapid movements and you get those rapid fire battles and, and all that kind of stuff. But from really about May 2nd to May 9 or 10, um, there's not a lot of major uh, quick movement, fast movement. And of course, what Grant is doing, he's, he's, um, he's holding up in this, in this, what I call the cul-de-sac um of the the bio pierre big black river bridge or big, big black river and, and the mississippi river he's in a very safe zone there um and so he's he's just kind of buying his time waiting uh for a couple different things number one for sherman in the 15th corps to come up because they've been left behind to deal you know some diversions at chickasaw bio and all that kind of stuff um so he's waiting on the 15th Corps to come up. He's also waiting on supplies to come up. And uh, he gives orders that, you know, we'll we'll begin our march forward uh, when everybody has three days rations in their haversacks ready to go. And it takes several days to 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 accumulate um, rations enough. And they still never get to their actual three days rations. Grant says, we got to go anyway. And I think that is the first indication, maybe not the first indication, but a significant indication that, you know, this is going to be this is going to be a tight run thing in terms of logistics, in terms of supplies, um, because we're just not able to to bring it in in this cul-de-sac, protective cul-de-sac near Grand Gulf. It's this new base of supplies. We're not able to bring up enough supplies while the army's stationary and not moving. What's going to happen when we moved, you know, 15, 20, 30 miles on farther uh, and we have to bring up, you know, everything by wagon or live off the land or, or, or whatever. So it is a significant gamble that Grant takes uh, to, to walk this tight rope out across the, the landscape of Mississippi, if you will, like he's marked, you know, walking across the Grand Canyon or something uh, till he can reach this, you know, safety on the other side. And that is the Azu River uh, where he can open up a new a new supply chain there. I think that feeds into one of the great myths of Grant. My cat is uh, at a chiming in here. I don't know if you can hear in the background. Mine has been meowing around here as well. So maybe they're meowing at each other. Oh, know. that could be. They could. Be. <laughs> uh, one of the myths of Grant is that he cuts himself off from his supply line and you know bolts into the interior, but that's not quite the case. Even though he later goes to to make that argument, um, what tell us? You know, unpack that for us just a little bit. Well, Grant doesn't do himself any service by muddling this up in his memoirs. He says two or three times in his memoirs, I cut loose now and then I cut loose later. And then I, you can only cut loose one time, you know, and he never actually really cuts loose. Um, he still has wagon trains coming in from Grand Gulf. Um, and that's one of the, the things that I really tried to key in on. Um, I, I determined when I was going to do this, I was going to figure out uh, how many wagon trains moved forward to the army, um, what was in those wagons, all that kind of stuff. Um, and sadly, I, I never was really satisfied with what I came up with, but I am satisfied that I, I mined everything that I could possibly even think of. Uh, I looked through so many records at the National Archives and, uh, you know, if it, it, there had to be records of what they put in wagons and, and all that. Whether those records still exist or not, I don't know. Um, they're not, e I will say this, they're not easily found in uh, the National Archives because I looked through every conceivable anything that might have to do with commissary, quartermaster, ordinance, um, dealing with 1863, and there just wasn't a lot up there. Now, you know, you know as well as I do, the National Archives, um, it, it's just unreal what all they have. Unfortunately, I don't think they actually know what all they have. Um, the online catalog is a, you know, it's a dumpster fire. There, there it is no help whatsoever. The the finding aid books in the finding room, you know, the 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 the, the uh, research room there, um, are the where you meet the archivists uh, are a are a little better. And I've actually found them online, so you can do searches and and all that. Um, but it, it, you know, there may be something else in the National Archives up there that might tell me, you know. Uh, I don't I don't know that there's anything that's going to tell me what's in the specific wagon and all that kind of stuff. 
uh, but I spent numerous trips up there and, and would come home just dejected and I didn't find anything, you know, but even in not finding anything, I think I found something, you know, um, but at any rate, what, what I determined through numerous sources like this, there's a little bit of stuff on that, uh, was that the vast majority of what's in those wagons are number one ordnance stores, uh, because, you know, even living off the land, you can't, um, you can't pick mini balls out of a field. They, you know, farmers in Mississippi aren't growing mini balls and, and cannonballs and, and all that. So Grant has to have that, especially as he's fighting numerous battles. He doesn't intend to fight all these, all these battles. Um, the other thing that he's really keying in on bringing forward are, are bread items, hardtack, uh, because he, he's not finding that at all in the Mississippi countryside. Uh, what they are finding and able to live off the land um, with our, our oats and, and uh, grain and, and uh, fodder and all that for the horses, uh, fortunately, but even that's a, a little bit uh, uh, thin, um, and a whole lot of meat. Uh, there's a lot of poultry, a lot of beef and, and all of that, and so they're finding a lot of meat, uh, but you know, I love a ribeye steak as good as anybody, and I could probably eat one every day. But if that's all I had, that's going to affect my diet. And actually, there's some there's some really good stuff out of Osterhaus's division. Um, Osterhaus is complaining to McClernand that my guys really need some bread. They they don't have uh, you know bread. All they have is meat, and it's beginning to affect their diet. He says there's a whole lot of diarrhea and and all that because of the prevalence of meat and so if you just eat meat and that's it it's it's going to affect your your digestive system and so grant is trying to bring forward as much um, bread stuff as as he can to temper that and to to counter that um but even then you know there's there's a couple of you know pretty big wagon trains that move forward um but once that is disseminated into the army, it's, it's just like a, you know, a wave that's coming up on, on shore. It's big as it starts, but it, the farther it, you know, gets to the, to the shore, it dissipates. And once all that is filtered out into the army, it's a pretty small wave and, and not, uh, not making a huge difference, um, in terms of their, their food. So there, there are, tons and tons and tons of um, diaries and letters and reports and all that of these guys by that what third week or or so of, of may um talking about just how dire this this uh, logistical situation is they hadn't had anything for a couple of days and and you know they're just just how bad it is so it's a it's a pretty critical time and and a pretty pretty important part of the story and that's why uh, i put a lot of emphasis um, on that um and you know i mean we've had histories of the battles and individual books and ed bars and and all that so i wanted to deal with the battles but i want to take a a little bit of a new um new approach to it in terms of the logistics yeah i thought it was really interesting when sherman eventually kind of gets up and around toward the end of all this movement he crosses the big black big, big black river say that five times fast yeah really north of the scene of the fighting like the first thing he does is like connects to the yazoo to get that base going yep that's the that's the key to this whole in fact i've um oftentimes doing talks or or whatever i would uh would talk about the key ground probably in this whole thing is up around Snyder's Bluff, Haynes Bluff, Chickasaw Bio area on, on the Yazoo, which, you know, it's not coincidental that that's what Sherman is first trying to take, you know, in the, in one of the very first movements uh, of this thing back in, in December. And uh, once they finally take it then in, uh, in mid May, that's when Sherman gives this famous, you know, Hey, this is great. I really didn't believe in this till now. And I see it now kind of thing. Um, and this is, this is good. Um, and at that point, it just becomes a matter of time because, the Confederates have fallen into Vicksburg. Um, they're they're cut off, and Grant has an unlimited supply line now that he can do whatever you know he he basically wants to. Now that said, it does take a few days to start the flow of supplies. You can't just snap your fingers and have a huge base at, at Chickasaw Bio, but it is open at that point. But it's actually after the first uh, assault on May the nineteenth that we're starting to to 
begin to see the supplies actually roll in. You know, that famous story after the, the I think so May the 20th or 21st, is Grant's riding down the line and some Ohio and starts yelling, hard tack, hard tack, and uh, taken up by the whole regiment, you know, and, and, um, and so they're still in pretty dire situation there, not only with, with bread and hard tack and food, um, but also ammunition, you know, if, if the, if the, um, if there are many assaults that take place like this, um, army wide, uh, you know, ammunition is going to start, you know, running out pretty, pretty quickly. And I think that's part of the, the delay of Grant launching the next assault on the 22nd, three days later, you know, um, he could have done it the next day on the 20th or something after the first one, but, uh, he wants to get his ducks in a row there and do it right. But you mentioned that, that, that Sherman did not support this movement. He, he has yeah. it in writing, and he was pretty vocal about it. And yet he says, like, I don't like this, but you tell me what to do, and I'm going to do it 100%. And then he has that epiphany later on that says, oh, you were right. This is one of the great campaigns of all time. Uh, mm -hmm. What a success. How like I think he, he learns from all that and applies it in, like, the Meridian campaign, the March to the Sea. Can you project a little forward for us about that? I think so. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of it probably is is Sherman. You know, he's pretty uh, he's pretty adamant that he's the 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 end all be all. He knows best, you know, pretty, uh, uh, pretty self-confident in his, his own uh, ability. Um, but he sees here that. Yeah, maybe I was I was wrong and old Grant was right, um, which must have come as a little bit of a shock to him, you know. Um, and so maybe he learns that there are different ways of doing things. Maybe I don't have to do it the exact same way that Grant would have done it. And actually, in the book, I kind of go into this whole Jomini Clausewitz type thing. Sherman is very Jominian in, in nature, uh, but he learns from it and and starts doing things, you know, not necessarily by the by the book. I think probably the biggest epiphany uh, or uh, not epiphany, but but reaction is for Sherman to say, you know, I was wrong. It, it takes a, that, those are pretty hard words to, to, to say, you know, even, even us today, you know, I was wrong. You were, you were right. Uh, neither Sherman nor Grant ever admit that they were wrong at Shiloh and that they were surprised. No, we weren't surprised. Not at all. Not no, not at all. I, we were expecting this. Um, and so Sherman, you know, admits, yeah, you were, you were right. I was wrong. Um, and the, the the another great example of that is Abraham Lincoln. You know, writes Grant that that wonderful letter at the end of the campaign and says, you know, when you started up the the river on east of the Big Black, I thought you should have gone down to Banks at Port Hudson. And I, you know, I don't, I didn't didn't think this was the right move and all that. But I want to make the acknowledgement that you were right and I was wrong. Imagine a, a president today uh, writing a letter like that. You know, I don't I don't see that. Uh, um, I mean, not just today even. I don't I don't see. Um, Harry Truman writing that to Douglas MacArthur or Franklin Roosevelt writing that to, to anybody. I, I don't know. You, you mentioned, um, you know, Lincoln wanted Grant to move down to banks and help with Port Hudson first. Uh, and I, I think one of the key and often underappreciated moments of the whole campaign is when Grant does get up to Grand Gulf after he outflanks it. And he comes to that decision like, no, I'm not going to go do that. I'm, yeah. I'm charging in um unpack that moment for me because i think that's such a i mean that's a that's a history changing decision really it is and i just i love grant later talks about this in um his trip around the world he's got that reporter this new york newspaper reporter john russell young um and so he's telling him about this and i just i love the way he puts it he he says you know i i'm I know that I was supposed to send a corps down to, to banks at what's been talked about and, and all that, but I got the Confederates on the run. I'm beating them at Port Gibson. Uh, the roads open to Vicksburg. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go to Vicksburg. And so he talks about figuring, actually figuring, I can just see him counting on his fingers. You know, he says, uh, he says, I figured out how long it would take to get a message that I'm not doing what they want. I'm going to Vicksburg, uh, to Washington via Memphis or Cairo and telegraph to Washington, back to the head of the telegraph, back down the river to me inland where I'll be. And he said, I, I figured I had a little over a week. He said, you can do a lot in eight days. <laughs> so he, he takes off and, and uh, he basically says, you know, it'll, it'll be determined whether I was right or wrong. Um, by the time I, uh, uh, you know, word gets back. And, and so, you know, if I win, everything will be fine. If I lose, Probably won't matter anyway. So, 
you know, that uh, I'm I'm going. So, and in the midst of that, he gets more than eight days because the Battle of Chancellorsville is taking place in the East, and the yeah. War Department's pretty distracted by all of that. So uh, he, he well, gets the whole that nation extra time. is, um, and particularly your boy Stonewall Jackson there. You know, the whole lingering and death and funeral on what the twelfth or or something. So this uh, it it consumes a lot of the air. And Grant is able to do this, and you know, uh, the only one paying attention is is Pemberton, really, and Pemberton's not paying a, a a whole lot of attention. Although, you know, it's interesting after the fact. I think uh, a lot of people, Grant and or Sherman and Lincoln, and everybody realizes, all right, it's a pretty big deal. Halleck, you know, compares with Napoleon. Um, but I I did a, a I looked at the Harper's Weekly. Um, newspapers and did kind of not a quantitative study but throughout the the bios and the canal and and grant's inland campaign siege and all that there really are more front page images covers you know they always have this big image on the front page uh more of that is vicksburg uh, than it is you know anything chancellorsville gettysburg there's some of that but but uh, week by week, every nearly every other week or so, there's something Vicksburg related right on that front cover, which kind of surprised me a little bit. So let's um, back up for a second and talk just about the military actions a little bit. Um, okay. And and you say in the introduction, this is an operational study, not a tactical study. So you're right. sort of the layer in which you look at these books or look at these battles is a little differently. And you say that that Port Gibson in particular deserves much greater bit of attention but um you know it really sets the stage for everything else you talk about in the book and so i like the way that you handle all that um uh, what sort of marks do you give the corps commanders uh, as they're kind of trying to get that lodgement well um of course mcclernand's leading the way and uh, mcclernand is is the one uh, that's doing the majority of the fighting uh, down on that that lower road uh, the rodney road uh, mcpherson comes in right at the end and and in my view really doesn't play that big of a hey there's is that maximus <laughs> um doesn't really play that that big of a role um there are some mcpherson uh, toadies out there that uh, that give him all kind of credit for <laughs> winning the war and and his influence you know winning world war ii and the cold war and and all that but that's some pretty pretty biased stuff there but um mcclernand you know i can't just say he's the end all be all there he he fights uh but it's not just a huge overwhelming victory even though he has huge overwhelming numbers uh but you have to take into account a little bit the the terrain You've been to Port Gibson, and it is, you know, I've, I've, for years and years and years, people have tried to get me uh, to to do a Port Gibson study, and um, it's uh, the the terrain. It is it's so complicated um, that it it's it's extremely difficult to figure out pretty much anything where anybody was. Now, the first as the the first parts of the battle there. Um, around Magnolia Church and Schaefer House and all that, you you can pick that out pretty well. And it has definitely helped that the Battlefield Trust and and State of Mississippi and others have preserved a lot of that land. So you can you can go on a lot of that, um, uh, a lot of that land down there. But when you get into the second phases, back um, toward Port Gibson and the afternoon fighting and all that, hardly any of that is is preserved, and it's hard to get on the land, and and it's just extremely complicated and so anybody doing a tactical study of port gibson and that's one of the reasons i haven't uh, haven't tackled it and, and not going to um but that's that's the the lack of familiarity with the terrain and you know that's something you have to have when you when you do do battles like this um it's a it's a tough nut to crack but somebody can do it and should do it and hopefully will do it yeah, Grant says the land around there stands on knife edge. Just because it stands on edge, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a pretty good description of it. Yeah. So now, you know, you you mentioned McLernan. He's leading the way. Um, you know, so it's an important position that he's in. Uh, 
and Grant and McLernan have this very complicated and, and adversarial relationship. James Wilson, after that battle, suggested Grant, maybe here's a chance you guys could patch things up because McLernan <laughs> does okay, and Grant doesn't have any part of it there. Um, <laughs> tell me about that that dynamic, because Grant seems to use McLernan for important missions, and McLernan seems to do okay, but there's still that tension. Yeah, there are two definite historiographical schools of thought in this. One's that McLernan's an idiot and and Grant hates him and just is enduring him, you know, because of the politics and all that. The other is that McLernan's pretty doggone good and Grant realizes that and and utilizes him for all the hard stuff. Um, and in most cases, I think, you know, as with most cases, the, the truth is probably somewhere in the in the middle. Grant probably doesn't have a choice. He doesn't get actual orders. Uh, allowing him to remove, relieve McLernan uh, until he's at Jackson on May the 14th. That's when the orders come allowing him to do it. And even then he doesn't, he doesn't uh, uh, relieve McLernan. Now he had gotten orders back in earlier in the, in the, in the winter, January, February, um, allowing Grant to supersede McLernan as the commander of the Vicksburg operations, but that's different than relieving him. Uh, so even when Grant gets the opportunity to relieve him, um, he, he doesn't. Um, and I deal with this a little bit in the siege book when McLernan, and that's one of those, those, um, uh, specific dates that I built a chapter around the removal of McLaren and all that kind of stuff um, in June, what June 19th, I believe, or 18th or 19th, whenever it was. Um, and I dealt with, with this whole dynamic and the conclusion I came to was that Grant did yes, need McLaren uh, for certain things. He, not the least of which was the political cover. You remove McLaren, you know, in the height of the campaign in May uh, and they're going to be, a lot of people that you know what what's going on with that um mcclernan does offer some some military uh, know-how he's a he's a fighter um, champion hill notwithstanding um he is a he's a he's a fighter um and so i think there is a a truth to the idea that grant uses mcclernan militarily you know obviously he leads the the movement down the mississippi on the west side in in april he leads the movement northward uh, the, the left flank, um, the critical left flank in, in May. Uh, so Grant uses him, but by the time you get to June, um, particularly June, whatever it is, 19th, when he was, when he's relieved, um, there's several different factors that came together. Um, uh, number one, the, it's basically decided. So Grant doesn't necessarily need that political cover and, you know, the, the, the issue is no longer in doubt. Uh, number two, he's got another, major general that is capable of corps command that has just arrived like the day or so before and that's eoc ord um and number three um grant has by that time received all the reinforcements that he's he's going to get um and so if grant was holding on you know i need somebody that is familiar with the situation that, you know, I don't want to change horses in, in midstream type thing. But by the time, in terms of reinforcements, uh, by the time you reach mid-June, uh, Grant has crossed that stream and is on the other side. Um, and now it wouldn't be such a big deal to change out a Corps commander just in the static siege operations at, at, at this point. So for several different reasons, I think it comes together and, and Grant finally sees that, OK, this is, um, uh, you know, I don't really need him anymore. I can cast him off without I can I can take the the flak, any political flak that I'm, I'm going to get. I don't really need him militarily because uh, the thing is in, in hand. I've got Ord here to 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 take over. And um, and so he says, yeah, this is this is this is time. Of course, uh, Sherman and McPherson are just just champing at the bit uh, to get rid of him. And they find where he's issued this this congratulatory order in the, to the newspapers, you know, and they say, aha, we got him. This is this is worthy of removal. And and uh, but I think it's Charles Dana that says it best. He says the uh, the publication of McLaren's order was the was the. Um, uh, I forget how he said it, but he, he basically says it is it is the occasion, not the cause for his removal. So uh, that that's the excuse they use. But um, it, it's been building for a long time. 
So Port Gibson's important for that lodgment. Um, let's jump ahead to Raymond. How would you ca characterize, like, what's the most important thing about Raymond we need to consider? Well, it it does have this larger strategic effect of, of getting Gramps' attention that, okay, there is something bigger than we thought maybe over on the right. I thought assumed that probably the 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 biggest uh, threat would be Pemberton Big Black River area where McLernan is over there uh, but hey something is obviously going on we can hear the firing you know he's not with McPherson um, in terms of the battle itself fairly small battle not a not a huge um, uh, fight by any means um, but it uh, it does get get Grant's attention and and uh, and forces him then to turn his attention eastward to deal with whatever's gathering there around Jackson Raymond Clinton area rather than turning strictly and moving westward to to uh, to to Vicksburg. So it's a it's an interesting little battle, um, a hard fought little battle, uh, but in terms of you know. Uh, Gettysburg or Chickamauga or Antietam or something it certainly doesn't doesn't rank up there but it's an interesting little little battle that has some some important uh, strategic ramifications it's a, a kind of an interesting opportunity for McPherson to prove himself a little bit too uh, you know as, as head of the core well and there again you get into the different schools of thought of of McPherson um I've thought about writing a biography of McPherson but I'm I'm afraid it wouldn't be very nice I'm not a huge McPherson fan uh but I think we see some inexperience of McPherson um I think we see him I think the way I describe it he's knocked off his equilibrium just a little bit and it takes him a little while to recover and and but then once he does with sheer weight of numbers uh he pushes on and wins obviously wins the 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 battle um i'm not sure with two divisions against one confederate brigade pretty large brigade but I, you know my teenage daughters might could have won that battle you know um but i think i think uh mcpherson is is learning at this point um i'm not sure uh you know if if grant looks at this and says okay uh, maybe I need to keep a little better handle on McPherson because the rest of the campaign, you know, McPherson's in the rear at, at uh, Champion Hill. Um, he's not involved in Big Black River Bridge. When he's put into the the uh, line at Vicksburg, he's in the center. You know, McLaren and Sherman will have the flanks, the probably more dangerous flanks um, connecting the Mississippi River. So, I'm, you know, I'm wondering if, if Grant kind of um, – has a, a second thought a little bit there in, in his mind of um, McPherson stumbled into this and he's sending me kind of panicked messages a little bit that, that um, he has to kind of clean up, you know, later in the day kind of, kind of thing. So I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't fall into the, into the idea that McPherson's the greatest, um, you know, that Sherman and Grant say if he'd lived, he would have eclipsed us all type thing. I don't, I don't, I don't see that. Uh, but I don't see that McPherson is just a bumbling, you know, idiot either. I, th I think he's got potential there and he shows some, some good stuff, but um, you know, the, um, he doesn't just turn out terribly well in the rest of the uh, rest of his campaigns either. You know, it'll be interesting to see what uh, comes out in these five volumes Atlanta campaign, how he, how he's treated in that, that Dave Powell's doing. So um, uh, anyway. Um, I, yeah, I agree. He needs his hand held a little bit and um, yeah. more so than the others. Uh, so Grant makes then the decision to go to Jackson instead of going straight north to cut the railroad. Um, what's your key takeaway with the battle of Jackson? Well, Jackson is not terribly well known in terms of a battle uh in fact have you ever heard of the battle of jackson do you know have any any idea what happened there or anything vaguely uh, stonewall jackson he sucks <laughs> yeah, up yeah. all that oxygen yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm 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 kidding you wrote a very very good book and in fact i i you know when when this book came out we were looking for cover illustrations and all that and kansas colorized that one in the library of congress and and I didn't need, of course, I've got your book. You sent me a copy and signed it and all that. I appreciate it. But I didn't even, didn't even think to look that it's the same, same uh, illustration on the, on the cover there. So I promise I, I was not trying to steal your thunder or anything. No, I didn't a even beautiful cover. It's a beautiful till, cover. Uh, didn't even, didn't even realize it till, till later on. Uh, but anyway, the, the battle of Jackson, again, another interesting little, a little fight or, or sort of a fight. Um, 
not a whole lot to it, but the 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 strategic thing obviously is the capture of the the capital of, of Mississippi and breaking the railroads and you know the potential to become a Confederate staging area for a for a relief. Um, I'm convinced that you know Charles Joseph E. Johnson could have landed on the Starship Enterprise or the Millennium Falcon or something and still wouldn't have done anything to relieve, you know, Vicksburg. But um, it uh, to me, in terms of this whole logistical thing, uh, it becomes critical in that any day lost might have added to this dire situation of Gramps, Gramps um, situation. So I, I wonder, had Johnston defended any and delayed any even a day or two uh at jackson if that may have made any any difference I, uh, you know that all that's again speculation what if but um i think and you're the jackson expert um i think johnson could have held out a little longer than <laughs> than he did given a little bit of the timid advance of Sherman and, and McPherson. And, uh, you know, I think it's Sherman that day is saying we may have to, uh, we may meet, um, entrenchments and may have to, to approach slowly or something and fight tomorrow. And, you know, even, even a day, um, potentially could have, have made a, a little bit of a difference. And, and consistent orders to Pemberton. That's, uh, maybe a different story, but uh... right. Yes, absolutely. So speaking of great uh, micro tactical studies, you wrote a wonderful book on Champion Hill. That's how I first came to know Tim Smith. Um, as you had to write about Champion Hill for this book, um, how did you approach that differently? Well, um, actually, uh, you know, there are two chapters on Champion Hill, two on Port Gibson, and then just one on the various uh, the the other smaller battles. Um, and again, I didn't want to make this a huge tactical study uh, because i'd already done champion hill um i just wanted to do a, a enough of a level kind of of the other battles you know a, a little larger macro view um which kind of fits in with the rest of the series as well uh you know arkansas post in the bio books um bio book i didn't just go into just huge details just one chapter on that of course it's not a huge battle um, Holly Springs, other, other things. Um, now in the assaults book, of course, that is more of a tactical study, uh, because that's a tactical battle, basically, probably the largest battle of the Vicksburg campaign, even larger in terms of numbers and, uh, maybe even casualties, all of that than, um, than Champion Hill. Uh, of course, Champion Hill is the, the most significant. I still stand by the decisive battle of Vicksburg subtitle, you know, um, so I, I basically, as I was doing that, I, I, and it very similar to what I was talking about Shallow, I basically just wrote those chapters from memory, wanted, you know, I knew the sequencing I wanted to tell in the different sections within the chapter and all that, uh, the chapters. And so I did it basically from memory. And then uh, I knew all the, the juicy quotes and, and all that, that I wanted to include. Uh, but then, you know, there are some, um, uh, some new manuscript things that I found uh, in researching these books that I had not used in the original Champion Hill book. So I included a um, you know few new quotations and and pithy quotes and and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I wanted to definitely wanted to keep it at the same level as the other battles and in in kind of harmony with the the more operational level of the of the study rather than a huge tactical thing. I didn't need to rewrite champion hill no need in it you know um and that, probably my thinking over the last you know champion hill came out 20 years ago this year um 20 years that's uh, wow that's a... um <laughs> at, probably my thinking has changed a little bit uh not a lot no earth shattering anything but uh maybe uh maybe a little bit i did go back and reread all the reports you know uh, in the official records and all that. So it, it might have some slight nuances, a little bit of, of updated thinking, but nothing, nothing earth shattering. 
And I want to actually take the opportunity to point readers to those books because, you know, aside from the five books that you have in this this wonderful set, I mean, I think that your book on the real horse soldiers about Grierson Drade really yeah, yeah. did a lot for me to help me understand, you know, what all this was doing to Pemberton, you know, and why Pemberton's so inefficient. Your book on Champion Hill is just outstanding. Uh, and your book, The Decision Was Always My Own about uh, Grant. Um, yeah. But yeah. You know, I think that that's uh, uh, just an excellent book. Well, I appreciate that. And that, that gave, those gave opportunities to go deeper in, into various subjects that, um, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't want to go to that level of dealing with Grant and writing to Julia and, um, you know, buying real estate back home in Illinois and all that in a campaign study for Vicksburg, you know, it just wouldn't fit in. So it, uh, it allowed a deeper analysis of, of certain areas. So before we wrap up, Big Black River, uh, main takeaway there? Oh, uh, again, an interesting little battle. Um, I had already actually written on, on Big Black River Bridge uh, in one of the uh, Southern Illinois University uh, Woodworth uh, essay books. And so I, I pretty much used that, I got their permission, all that. Um, but again, reread all the reports and, and updated it a little bit in terms of newer quotations or whatever that I found. There's the cat. Um, but, uh, you know, still uh, interesting, interesting little battle. Uh, Takeaway in terms of the larger context uh, would be, again, Pemberton had an opportunity to um, delay here at the Big Black River Bridge uh, or Big Black River itself. If um, if Pemberton holds for even a day or two or three, what might that have done in terms of the logistical uh, situation? But he gets caught way out of position, not only across the Big Black River, but also across Baker's Creek. And of course, he gets whacked on the head, you know, both times moving back across Baker's Creek, he loses a division, Loring's division, and then back across the Big Black River Bridge, he nearly loses Bowen's division. So it, it you know, being out of position and trying to get back across these two major watersheds are are, are extremely um, um, bad for him. Um, and so I, you know, the only alternative, and it would have taken hindsight probably for Pemberton to realize this. I don't know. He didn't know Grant's logistical situation probably although johnston had warned him you know hit him work on their logistics because they're going to be inland from the river and and they're bound to be having logistical problems johnston for one thing you know even a, a clock is right twice a day a broken clock's right twice a day but johnston <laughs> actually that right um but, you know, it, you, it wouldn't be a matter of just holding at the Big Black River Bridge. You would have to obviously hold down at Baldwin's Ferry uh, and a couple of the intermediate ferries in between. Um, you would have to hold northward at, uh, at Bridgeport and probably all the way up to Messenger's Ferry. Uh, because Grant, you know, if, if Pemberton is holding the high ground west of the Big Black River at the River Bridge, he's obviously going to try to send people around and that's actually Sherman crosses at Bridgeport with the with the um, the pontoon bridge there not not your regular pontoons like you think of Fredericksburg you know the wooden boats so these are actually rubber boats that they inflate which uh, is is very interesting uh, but if the Confederates are holding there then Sherman or Grant probably will shift to the next uh, ferry or, or crossing point north. So it would be multiple areas that Pemberton would have to hold, but he would have his entire army to, to do that. And we're not talking defeat Grant necessarily as he's trying to cross the river, um, but merely hold for a few more days, which might, again, cause logistical problems for Grant. And Grant doesn't know that Johnston's not coming, but Grant thinks that Johnston might be coming. And so that's also a kind of added element of urgency to all. A exactly. Like yeah. Yeah. And for some reason, Grant thinks Johnston is the greatest Confederate general. And I'm not sure how he comes to that conclusion unless it's the he's thinking in terms of he's the greatest Confederate general that helped us win. Kind of, kind of thing. I don't, I, you may have gathered. I don't particularly like Johnston. Yeah, I'm not a Johnston. That's a different story. Yeah. So, <laughs> and we really haven't had the chance to talk much about the Confederates um, in this conversation. So, I'm going to have to have you come back and, and talk about the Confederate leadership during the. We'll do. Camp. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. 
Uh, any final thoughts about the inland campaigns for Vicksburg? No, I just appreciate you having me on again. I appreciate all your support through this whole. I think we've done on every, one on every book, I, I believe. But I uh, appreciate the, the support of Emerging Civil War and what all you folks are doing. Y'all are doing some really good work. So appreciate uh -huh. all of it. Thanks so much, Tim. Always fun to sit down with a friend and talk about his work. So thanks for being with us. Lots of fun. Thanks a lot. I'm Chris Mikowski for the Emerging Civil War podcast. We'll see you online and on the battlefield.